Welcome back to another talk on obstetrics. Our topic here is going to be premature rupture of membranes, which is not uncommon, and it is something that commonly comes up on the USMLE and on medical licensing examinations, whatever that may be. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click the link below in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, if you could just consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long ways to help keep these videos free. Thank you very much for your consideration. So premature rupture of membranes is a very simple concept, and it's defined as the rupture of membranes prior to the onset of labor. Normally, you should have labor starting, regular contractions, three or four contractions every 10 minutes with cervical change, and then have rupture of membranes at some point after that. In premature rupture of membranes, you have rupture of membranes before you have those contractions and that cervical change. Now, I want you to pay attention to this terminology, premature rupture of membranes. When they say premature, they're referring to the rupture of membranes being premature before the onset of labor. They're not referring to the rupture of membranes happening before the baby is at quote-unquote maturity at term. So you can have premature rupture of membranes at 38, 39 weeks. They're not referring to prematurity of the fetus here. So premature rupture of membranes, that premature means that it's happening before the onset of labor, not in the premature before 37 week of gestation period, okay? So we're going to talk about the terminology because it can be a little confusing. When a woman comes to you with premature rupture of membranes, she's going to to describe my water broke. That's what she's going to say because when there is this gush of fluid, uh, which is the rupture of membranes, women refer to that as her water breaking. Okay, so it may be described to you on the test as a sudden gush of fluid from the vagina or she may just come in in real life, she's going to come in and she's going to say, I think my water broke. And when you ask how, uh, how far apart are the contractions, how many contractions have you had, how, uh, how often are you having contractions? She's going to tell you that she's not having contractions or that the contractions are quite far apart or that you look at the, the, the vagina and the cervix and there's no cervical change. Hence, she's not in labor. Okay, so here is our terminology and this can be very confusing so I want you to pay very close attention here. Premature rupture of membranes is the rupture of... Now, when it's... Here we're referring to just premature rupture of membranes. When you see premature rupture of membranes or PROM, this is rupture of membranes prior to the onset of labor beyond 37 weeks of gestation. Now, this is in contrast to preterm premature rupture of membranes or PPROM. And that is when you have the same thing, rupture of membranes prior to the onset of labor, but it's before 37 weeks gestation. Okay, so all the way up to the point right before 37 weeks gestation. If it's at 37 weeks and zero days or beyond, then that's just premature rupture of membranes. And I entitled this, uh, this lecture Premature Rupture of Membranes because all of these things are premature rupture of membranes. Okay, so that's premature rupture of membranes when it happens beyond 37 weeks and preterm premature rupture of membranes when it happens before 37 weeks. But the same thing is going on. It's the same it's, it's the same symptoms, the same presentation, it's just a matter of when it's happening. Now, preterm rupture of membranes is any time you have rupture of membranes before 37 weeks of gestation. Okay, so just if they say preterm rupture of membranes, but it doesn't have the word premature in it, that's just saying that there's rupture of membranes before 37 weeks of gestation. She may be in labor or she may not be. If she's not in labor, then it's PPROM. If she is in labor and she has rupture of membranes, then it's just preterm rupture of membranes. It's not premature if she's in labor because she's having labor with the rupture of membranes. Hence, it's not premature rupture of membranes. And then there's this other thing that is also, if you were to do the acronym PROM, but prolonged rupture of membranes, that's not PROM. Okay, PROM is premature rupture of membranes. When they're saying prolonged rupture of membranes, that's when you have rupture of membranes 
and it's been 18 hours since rupture of membrane and you still have not had delivery. This does not necessarily have to coincide with premature rupture of membranes. You can have a woman who's on labor and delivery ward who was in labor, she had rupture of membranes, and it's been 18 hours now, and she ha still has not delivered. That would be prolonged rupture of membranes. And some of the complications that can come from premature rupture of membranes, from preterm premature rupture of membranes, and prolonged rupture of membranes, uh, you can have some of the same complications, namely infection. So this is kind of another way of thinking about it graphically. So anything before 37 weeks of gestation is, if you have rupture of membrane, is preterm rupture of membranes. If you don't have labor, then it's preterm premature rupture of membranes or PPROM. If it's after 37 weeks, 37 weeks or beyond, and you have rupture of membranes, then it's rupture of membranes. If you haven't had labor yet, but you've had rupture of membranes, then that's premature rupture of membranes. So another way to think about it is if you have rupture of membranes, if it's before 37 weeks, that's preterm rupture of membranes. If you are in labor, then it's just preterm labor with rupture of membranes. If you're not in labor, then you have preterm premature rupture of membranes. If you're beyond 37 weeks and you have rupture of membranes, if you are in labor, then you have labor with rupture of membranes. That's common. If you are not in labor beyond 37 weeks with rupture of membranes, that is the definition of premature rupture of membranes. So what we're going to be talking about here is preterm premature rupture of membranes and premature rupture of membranes. Now I highlighted some things here. Before 23 weeks, that's considered non-viable. So if you have preterm premature rupture of membranes and it's before 23 weeks that is a very unfortunate situation and the outcome is typically pretty dismal. I also highlighted 32 to 34 weeks. This is also another critical period because it's at these two weeks where the fetal lungs mature. After 34 weeks we really don't have to worry about the fetal lungs not being mature enough. We can typically bet on after 34 weeks the fetal lungs will be mature. Before 32 weeks we know they're not premature. 30, or we, we know they are not mature yet. Uh, between 32 and 34 weeks, it's a kind of a question mark. So typically during this period, we will do an amniocentesis to test the fetal lungs for maturity because we don't know if they're mature during this period. They may be, they may not be. And then I highlighted 37 to 40 weeks. This is term. Okay. So some of the risk factors for premature rupture of membranes, and this goes for premature rupture of membranes and preterm premature rupture of membranes. Uh, the number one, one of the biggest risk factors is ascending infection. So this can be something like chorioamnionitis, it can be group B strep, uh, it can be gonorrhea, chlamydia, anything that infects the cervix, vagina, that is, uh, can cause an ascending infection which can then go into the amniotic fluid, into the chorion and amnion, and what happens is you can get an inflammation, and that inflammation, of course, remember what inflammation does, it releases prostaglandins. And what does prostaglandins do? It ripens the cervix. And so those things can cause rupture of membranes because those are things that we use, prostaglandins, for instance, to induce labor. Uh, and that also weakens the membranes. So you can think of chorioamnionitis or this inflammation, this infection, it can either precede or cause premature rupture of membranes or because it weakens the membranes that can make it easier to get chorioamnionitis. So chorioamnionitis can be either a cause of premature rupture of membranes or it can be a result of premature rupture of membranes. Having had a previous pregnancy with PROM or PPROM is another risk factor. Of course, genital tract infections can cause this ascending infection. Urinary tract infections. Cigarette smoking. Not exactly sure why that is, but that's another big risk factor. Polyhydramnios is another risk factor, probably because there's more amniotic fluid, more pressure in the uterus. Multiple gestation along the same lines. Antepartum bleeding. Invasive procedures like amniocentesis can easily rupture the membranes. I misspelled that there. Cervical insufficiency. And then underweight, if mother is underweight. So the workup. So a woman comes in and she says, my water broke. What do we do? 
So first we want to look at her vitals and do a physical exam. So the major complication of PROM and PPROM is chorea amnionitis. So we want to look at her temperature. Does she have a fever? We want to look at her heart rate. Uh, does she have tachycardia? And we want to feel her uterus. Okay, we're looking for uterine tenderness because if there's uterine tenderness, it suggests that there's inflammation and possibly an infection going on. Now, chorea amnionitis can look like anything from asymptomatic all the way to she's frankly septic. Okay, so chorea amnionitis has a very wide presentation and so you need to pay attention to these things. Maternal fever, tachycardia, and uterine tenderness are three of the big ones. Some other things you wouldn't notice during physical exam would be like an elevated white count, for instance. So if there's any, if there's any uh, confusion or you don't know, you can always get a CBC. Okay, next what we want to do, and this is critical, when we suspect premature rupture of membranes is you want to do a sterile speculum examination. What you're looking for first is pooling of amniotic fluid and you're looking for it in the posterior fornix. So you take the speculum, you go in, and you're looking in sort of vaginal vault area and you're looking for amniotic fluid. Now while you're looking for the amniotic fluid, if you do see some, what you want to do then is a nitrazine test. And all this is is you take a little strip of pH paper and you go in and you are going to test the pH of that fluid. And if the pH is more than 7.1, which will turn the paper blue, that's considered a positive nitrazine test, and that is consistent with premature rupture of membranes. Now, there are, it's possible to have fluid in the vagina, but it not be amniotic fluid, and then that would be not consistent with premature rupture of membranes. Consider one of the things that can, can mimic premature rupture of membranes. Let's say mom's bladder is full, and as we know, later on in the pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, as the baby's head is pushing up against the bladder, she can have a stress urinary incontinence. And so maybe she has a full bladder, she coughs, has a gush of fluid, but it's actually not coming from the uterus, it's actually coming from her bladder. Okay, so that's a possibility, and she may confuse that and say her water broke. Okay, and if, that, if, if any of that fluid gets into the vagina, it may look like amniotic fluid, but in that case, the 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 pH is going to be lower than 7.1. And that, that uh, it, depending on, on the, the urine, you know, and how much it mixes with any kind of uh, fluid that's already in the vagina, it may be lower, uh, usually is lower. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Another thing, and this is even better, is the fern test. So what you're doing is you're taking a little bit of the amniotic fluid, you're putting it onto a slide, let it dry, and then looking under a microscope, and it should have this ferning pattern. Okay, so we do all of these things. And what you should have is pooling. When you look on the speculum examination, you should have a positive nitrazine test and a positive fern test. Okay, there are some other things that you can do. There's something called the AmniSure. That you, you may have access to that depending on your hospital. Another thing that is theoretically possible uh, to do but typically not done because it's invasive is you can do as if you're doing a, an amniocentesis and you inject this dye into the into the amniotic fluid and then you put a tampon into her cervix and then you look at the tampon and see if it's turned blue and if it has then you know you have rupture of membranes because that fluid is coming out into the tampon. Uh, that's also called an amnio infusion test. Uh, and then another thing that you can do is just to do a sonography and when you look on sonography, of course, because the fluid has came out, if you have premature rupture of membranes, because the fluid has come out, you should have less fluid than you would otherwise expect. And so you should have a oligohydramnios because a lot of that fluid has already come out. Okay, so let's say that you have positive pooling test, positive nitrazine test, positive fern test. You know you have premature rupture of membranes. Now what you want to do is these various tests that are going to help you in certain regards. So first you want to do a sonography and what we're doing is we're going to confirm the gestational age. Typically she knows how far along she is, but we're going to just confirm that. So you confirm gestational age and you're looking for any possible anomalies. So you do an OB ultrasound. Next we want to get cervical cultures for chlamydia and gonorrhea. If those are positive, what that tells you is that there may be an infection. So you'll want to treat for that because the baby may be at risk for getting congenital chlamydia or congenital gonorrhea. 
Next, you want to do rectovaginal cultures for group B strep. In the event that she needs to deliver, if we haven't done a, a, a swab for group B strep, and typically we don't do that until 36, 37 weeks, then we need to know if she's GBS positive because if she is GBS positive, we need to give her penicillin uh, before she delivers. Next, we want to get a urinalysis, and this goes for if she has uh, any kind of, uh, and remember that urinalysis, uh, or sorry, urinary tract infection can be a trigger for premature rupture of membrane, so we want to know if there's any kind of, of urinary tract infection going on. And then we want to hook her up to cardiotochometry to make sure that the baby is doing okay. One of the complications of premature rupture of membranes because you lose amniotic fluid is compression of the umbilical cord. And so we want to make sure that there's not too much compression of the umbilical cord. And what would we expect? What kind of rhythm would we expect or pattern would we expect uh, on cardiotechometry if there is umbilical cord compression? This is just a review we would expect to see variable decelerations if there's uh, significant umbilical cord compression. Okay, so this is what pooling looks like, and here you can see the fluid down here. Okay, so that's pooling. This is a nitrazine test, so you take this little piece of paper, you stick it in, and you should be beyond 7.1 pH. So it should look like, uh, it should be darker than the 7.0 indication. If it's lighter than that, that is a negative nitrazine test. Okay, and then this is the fern test. So you take some of that fluid and you look at it under the microscope and this is a ferning pattern. Okay, it looks like a fern plant. So here you see it again at a little bit less resolution. Okay, so let's particularly talk about preterm premature rupture of membranes. So this is rupture of membranes prior to the onset of labor before 37 weeks gestation. Now without intervention, about half of these women will go into labor within 24 hours and three quarters of them will go into labor within two days. We can do some things that are scientifically proven to prolong the time before she goes into labor. And that is a good thing. Okay, that's a good thing. We want to prolong the amount of time before this baby is delivered because we want we need to do things like mature the fetal lungs. Now that's number one because if she delivers this baby and let's say she's at 30 weeks, we got a major problem. Those lungs aren't going to be developed and baby's going to have respiratory distress syndrome, which is a big problem. Okay, so it's a, what we want to do, our main goal, if we can, and there are certain times when we really can't, but if we can, we want to prolong the time between uh, when she's having these rupture of membranes and when this baby is delivered. Now, there are, there, there's, we have to balance a couple things. We have to balance the, how long we want to keep this baby in so we can sort of, uh, so we can prevent some of the complications of preterm delivery, but we also have to balance the fact that you can get infection if you have a rupture of membranes that have gone on too long before delivery. So you kind of have to balance those two things. So prolonged preterm premature rupture of membranes is associated with increased risk of chorea amnionitis, abruptio placenta, and umbilical cord prolapse. So those are some of the things that we need to take into consideration. If we leave this, this premature rupture of membranes, if we leave this too long and we don't deliver the baby, some of these things can develop. So like I said, you have to balance uh, having a preterm a, a pre baby being delivered and some of these complications that can happen if you have prolonged rupture of membranes. So the management is going to depend on the gestational age. So, like I said, again, you have to weigh the risk of premature birth against the risk of neonatal and maternal infection if you let this go on too long. You don't want to deliver these babies any later than 34 weeks. Okay, so if the baby is less than 23 weeks gestation, the outcome is so dismal that there's really not a whole lot you can do. So you can either induce, which is essentially an abortion, or you can monitor the mother, send her home on bed rest, and 
there's a possibility that the membranes may reseal, but it's not likely. And so when she, when she starts having labor, she can then come in and then deliver the baby. Uh, and typically the baby will, will die. If she's remote, 23 to 31 weeks, she's technically, the baby is viable. So what we're going to do is conservative management. We don't want to deliver this baby yet because, again, there's the possibility that the membranes may reseal. And so what we're going to do is we're going to prepare for the worst. So we're going to give antibiotics to abate the infection, uh, reduce the risk of infection. We're going to give corticosteroids because if this baby is delivered, we want to make sure the lungs are as mature as possible. And then we'll do serial evaluation and bed rest, okay, hoping that those membranes will reseal. Okay, so that's conservative management. So we're not going to deliver her necessarily. Uh, we're going to, like I said, prepare for the worst. So prepare for the possibility of infection, prepare for the possibility of delivery of the baby and mature the fetal lungs, and then serial evaluation and bed rest. If she's after 32 weeks but before 33 weeks, in that period where we don't know if the fetal lungs are developed or not, what we're going to then do is an amniocentesis to test for fetal lung maturity. If the fetal lungs are mature, then we're going to deliver the baby because there's a lot fewer complications delivering a baby with mature lungs than there are not delivering that baby and risking the possibility of fetal or maternal infection. If they're not mature, what we're going to do is give antibiotics, corticosteroids, and deliver that baby at 34 weeks or before if there's complications. Okay, so if the fetal lungs are mature, we treat this baby like it's term or near term, and we deliver the baby. If the fetal lungs are not mature, we treat it sort of like it's in this 23 to 31 week period where we do this conservative management and wait for those fetal lungs to mature, give antibiotics to reduce the risk of infection, and then deliver the baby uh, when we can. And then if she's beyond 34 weeks, then we just deliver because we know the fetal lungs are mature. You don't need to do an amniocentesis. The likelihood of the fetal lungs being mature after 34 weeks is very, very high. So we're not going to do amniocentesis. We're just going to deliver. In any case, no matter what these are, if you make it to 34 weeks, then you're going to deliver at 34 weeks because the risk of infection beyond 34 weeks outweighs the risk of prematurity. Now, we know that giving antibiotics increases the amount of time that the mother can hold on to the baby uh, before delivery. Uh, it's... Uh, Remember that 75% will go into labor within 48 hours without intervention. If you give antibiotics, the median amount of time that these mothers can continue holding on to the baby goes up to about a week. And that's very, very important because when you're giving these corticosteroids, it gives you a lot of time for these to work. Okay, it typically takes the corticosteroids a few days to mature the fetal lungs. So if you can hold on to this baby for a week, that really helps. So that's why we give the antibiotics, because it increases the amount of time uh, that the mother will be able to hold on to the baby. It also reduces the risk of chorioamnionitis and neonatal sepsis. So there's a few things that work in our favor by giving these antibiotics. What do we give for antibiotics? We're going to first give IV antibiotics. So we're going to need to admit her to the hospital. We're going to give ampicillin and erythromycin, IV and you'll give that for 48 hours. If you're interested in the dosage, which you don't need to know for the test, the ampicillin you're going to give 2 grams every 6 hours, uh, and that's intravenously, and erythromycin you're going to give 250 milligrams every 6 hours. And we do this for 2 days. Uh, then at that point you can switch her to PO. You can give her, um, you give her amoxicillin and erythromycin uh, moxicillin is going to be 250 milligrams three times a day. Erythromycin is going to be uh, 333 milligrams three times a day. And you give this for five days. Typically, she'll go into labor by this point. Okay, At some point uh, during this uh, antibiotic course or shortly after. Uh, but this is very useful, like I said, because it prolongs the amount of time that she'll before she goes into labor and that helps uh, the corticosteroids have time to work. So the corticosteroids will give, uh, if before 32 weeks or if the fetal lungs are not mature, 
Okay, so uh, uh, I got this coming up. Okay, so we'll give the corticosteroids and we give beta methasone intramuscularly, and you have to give that once a day for two days. So you give 12 milligrams day one, 12 milligrams day two, and uh, that helps mature the fetal lungs. Okay, so this is a sort of algorithm that I found online. So you confirm the diagnosis, and then at that point you're going to do various things. You're going to get cervical culture, a rectovaginal culture for group B strep, and a urine culture, and then you want to continuously monitor, make sure the baby's not going into fetal distress. If anything uh, infectious happens or the baby shows sign of distress, then you need to deliver. So if there's chorea amnionitis, if there's abruptio placenta, which the risk of that does go up if there's any kind of infection, uh, or if the baby shows any sign of distress, then you need to deliver. Because it takes time for that group B strep to come back, if you're not able to get the group B strep culture back, or if you just haven't done one, which typically you won't have done one before you, uh, uh, before you hit 36, 37 weeks, uh, then you're going to assume that she has group B strep because the, the uh, complications of having group B strep, if it's not treated uh, intrapartum, uh, you can, uh, the baby can get neonatal sepsis and die. So you're, you're just going to assume she has a group B strep if you don't have any uh, culture. And so you'll give her penicillin. If there's no sign of infection and the baby seems to be doing fine, then it just depends on how far along she is. I wouldn't memorize this. Just memorize what I told you back here. Okay? So pre-viable, you induce or monitor. Remote, you do conservative management, give antibiotics to corticosteroids, uh, evaluate her, and uh, bed rest. And if she's in that 32 to 33-week bubble, you'll give her... Uh, you'll give her uh, amniocentesis to assess fetal lung maturity, deliver if it's mature. If it's immature, you'll do this conservative management, antibiotics, corticosteroids, and if she's 34 weeks or beyond, you deliver her. Okay. So if you want to look at that in greater detail, you can do that. Okay, so premature rupture of membranes is a rupture of membranes prior to the onset of labor beyond 37 weeks. So this is a little bit easier to manage because we're just going to deliver these women. The major concern is the development or existence of chorea amnionitis. Chorea amnionitis, remember, can cause premature rupture of membranes. So we want to make sure that she doesn't have that. And so if there's anything, maternal fever, tachycardia, signs of sepsis, uterine tenderness, we're going to treat her like she has chorea amnionitis and give her antibiotics. If she doesn't have any of that stuff, we are going to deliver her. And because we're going to deliver her, we typically do not have to give antibiotics for uh, preventing chorea amnionitis because we're, we're just delivering her. And the risk for chorea amnionitis is really uh, when you have prolonged rupture of membranes. And because we're just going to deliver her, we don't have to worry about developing chorea amnionitis. We do have to worry about that in preterm premature rupture of membranes because we're typically going to leave her for more than 18 hours before we deliver her. With premature rupture of membranes, after 37 weeks, we're going to be delivering her promptly. So we don't need to worry about giving antibiotics. It's the same thing when you have preterm premature rupture of membranes after 34 weeks. We don't have to worry about giving her those antibiotics uh, for chorea amnionitis because we're delivering her right away. Okay, so you only give those antibiotics for chorea amnionitis when we're going to be delaying delivery for more than 18 hours. So the management is first to, uh, the question is whether to induce labor or let it occur spontaneously. There are studies that show that induction with oxytocin is likely the best approach um, because there's increased risk of intrauterine infection with duration of rupture of membranes. Okay, so you're probably going to be inducing her. So she comes in, her water is broken, she is not in labor, we're going to induce labor. Because we want to get that baby out soon, because the longer she goes with rupture of membranes and not delivering that baby, the greater likelihood she has of developing some kind of infection. And then if she hasn't had a group B strep test, because it's going to take a couple days for a group B strep culture to come back, we will not be able to determine definitively whether she's group B strep positive or not. 
So you'll administer penicillin uh, if there's no recent group B strep test, and typically there won't be. Uh, if she's 37 weeks, it just depends on whether she's came in or not. I mean, some women wait till 37, 38 weeks. Typically, they should be coming in around 36 weeks to get their group B strep uh, test. But uh, it just depends on whether she's had it, okay? So what I would just remember is if she hasn't had one, we don't have record whether she's GBS positive or not, you're going to treat her like she is group B strep positive. If she's group B strep negative and we know that, then you don't have to worry about this. So the complications of PROM and PPROM, if the fetus remains in the uterus, and remember, this is that balancing thing we're talking about. If the fetus remains in the uterus, the big problem is infection. So mom can develop chorioamnionitis, she can become septic, or she may develop DVT because she's on bed rest. For baby, it's infection and sepsis, umbilical cord compression because there's less amniotic fluid, and pulmonary hypoplasia. With preterm delivery, we're not really worried about mom, we're worried about baby. And there's all sorts of things that can go wrong if the baby is premature. You can get respiratory distress syndrome, that's why we give the steroids. We prefer to give the steroids, but there are some cases where we can't give steroids. Like, let's say mom has chorioamnionitis, we need to deliver the baby right away and we don't have time for the steroids to work. So respiratory distress syndrome is a possibility. Patent ductus arteriosus, which can happen in any premature baby. Intraventricular hemorrhage, again, any premature baby. Cerebral palsy. This is a complication of chorioamnionitis. Necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy of prematurity, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Really, all these things are just complications of prematurity. And then endomyometritis, which can happen if mom has an infection uh, that can involve the lining of the uterus. So just to review, premature rupture of membranes is rupture of membranes after 37 weeks gestation. Preterm premature rupture of membranes is rupture of membranes before 37 weeks gestation. The major complication of both of these is chorioamnionitis, but that can also proceed and be the cause of these things. The signs of chorioamnionitis are maternal fever, tachycardia, uterine tenderness, fetal distress, and sepsis. If you have any reason to believe there's chorioamnionitis, you need to give IV antibiotics. The diagnosis for premature rupture of membranes, either PROM or PPROM, is pooling, which you'll see on sterile speculum examination, nitrazine positive, ferning positive, or if you do sonography, you may see less amniotic fluid than you would expect. The treatment for PPROM depends on the gestational age. You give antibiotics and corticosteroids before there's fetal lung maturity. If you're in that 32 to 33 week range, then you can do amniocentesis to determine whether there's uh, fetal lung maturity or not. If there's not, you'll treat this baby with antibiotics and corticosteroids. If there is, you'll deliver. You'll also deliver at any point beyond 34 weeks. If it's premature rupture of membranes, that's term, so you can just do delivery. Remember to give an, uh, antibiotics for group B strep if there's no recent test and you need to deliver the baby right away. Okay, so let's do a couple practice questions just to make sure that we've solidified this here. A 20-year-old G1P0 at 35 weeks and 2 days presents complaining of a gush of fluid from her vagina. On speculum examination, there is evident fluid in the posterior fornix. It's nitrazine positive and fern positive. She denies contraction and her cervix is fingertip length. There is no fever or uterine tenderness. Which of the following is the best next step in management? A. Tocolysis with magnesium sulfate. B. Betamethasone. C. Betamethasone and magnesium sulfate. D. Confirm PROM with tampon test. Or E. Expectant management. Okay, so I'll let you pause it here. And the answer is expectant management. So she is 35 weeks. And so... All expectant management is, is let the pregnancy take its course. Now, if another option, uh, instead of expectant management, you can induce delivery, that's fine too. It's You'll never be asked to, to choose between the two, uh, even though there are some studies that say that induction is better than just letting the, the uh, letting, waiting for labor to take its course. We do know that Quite a few of these women, most of these women will go into labor uh, on their own. Okay, so you can either induce or do expectant management. Either are technically 
acceptable. If it were me, I would induce the woman, though, with Pitocin. Uh, tocolysis would not be, this would be the opposite of what we want to do. We want labor to happen because we're beyond 34 weeks. Betamethasone is not necessary after 33 to 34 weeks. Uh, so betamethasone with magnesium sulfate certainly wouldn't be advisable. And we don't need to confirm PROM with the tampon test because we're nitrazine positive, firm positive, there's pooling, that's enough evidence. Okay, so expected management or induction of delivery. A 24-week G4P3 presents at 31 weeks and 3 days and says she thinks my water broke. On speculum examination, there's evident fluid in the posterior fornix. It's nitrazine positive and firm positive. She denies contraction in her cervix as fingertip length. There is no fever or uterine tenderness. Which of the following is the best next step in management? A, expectant management. B, betamethasone. C, betamethasone and ampicillin erythromycin. D, amniocentesis to confirm fetal lung maturity. Or E, tocolysis with magnesium sulfate. Okay, and the answer to this one is C, betamethasone and ampicillin erythromycin. So we're not beyond 32, 33 weeks. We're not at that 32, 33 weeks uh, where we don't know if the fetal lungs are mature or not. When you're at, bef before 32 weeks, you can bet that those fetal lungs are not mature. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're, we're not even going to do amniocentesis because we know that the fetal lungs are not mature at this point. At 31 weeks, the fetal lungs are not mature. That happens in that 32 to 34 week period. Uh, so we don't need to do amniocentesis. Uh, so uh, expectant management, no, we can't do that because we know that the fetal lungs aren't mature. Uh, we need to give betamethasone. So that leaves you with B and C. Uh, so why do we give ampicillin erythromycin? Well, because we want this pregnancy to go on as long as possible. Okay, We, we want this to continue, so we need to give antibiotics because those antibiotics not only do they reduce the risk of chorioamnionitis but remember they are known to prolong the time between rupture of membranes and delivery so it gives the betamethasone some time to work so we give betamethasone and ampicillin erythromycin we're not going to do tocolysis here even though tocolysis you you might do it I didn't include that as part of management because it's controversial so if you did do tocolysis, you would have to do it with the betamethasone and ampicillin erythromycin, but this is mandatory. Okay, some doctors will do tocolysis along with this, but you can't do tocolysis alone. You need to give the betamethasone for those fetal lungs to mature. You need to give the ampicillin erythromycin to reduce the risk of chorioamnionitis and to try to prolong this pregnancy. And that's all I've got for you. I will be doing a lecture pretty soon on chorioamnionitis in greater detail, and then I'll do some more on some infections that can happen during and after pregnancy. I will see you next time.